I want to read something to you guys uh, before I start. Paul says this in, in 1 Corinthians 2, chapter 2. This, this is, this is, if I were to ask you, what would you want from God, what would you say? More, more of him. Wisdom. Intimacy. Joy. Power. Love. Paul says this. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Out of everything that you could choose, out of everything that you could want, he said, I would choose, I would want to know Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is the, the super apostle, Paul. Visions, been up into heaven. First Corinthians, I, I knew a man not too long ago, whether in the body or out of the body, heard inexpressible things that, can, that, that cannot be released here on earth. Seen inexpressible things in heaven cannot be released here on earth. And yet, if you were to ask him, what is your one desire? I would want to know Jesus Christ and him crucified. What on earth is he talking about? What on earth is this man talking about? I, um, <clears throat> to me, just because we are in this study, to me that says there's something to be uncovered about the crucifixion of Jesus that we don't know. There are benefits, there's an experience that we're not having. This man, in my opinion, has had more experience in the supernatural, had seen miracles, signs, wonders, and the thing that he asked for was to know Jesus and him crucified. We're in this study. <clears throat> Last week we studied, we, we were talking about the cross. I can't say we studied it because it's barely scratched the surface. But uh, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about this message and the topics. And uh, I was just thinking, you know, the difficulty in what I'm about to talk about uh, in that there, there's a place uh, because we don't understand it, and because the subject is so big, our minds get tired and just go, and they just check out. Um, the writer of Hebrews says this. This is another really interesting phrase. In verse 8, 11, 8, By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. We've heard this one. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. But this is the one that gets me. For he was looking for a city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Now, the reason why this is just interesting to me is uh, anytime we see a house that we like and we're kind of looking for a house, um, we always look at the beauty of the outside of it. Oh, I like the yard. I like the, oh, look at that color of brick. Oh, this is great. Look at the driveway that goes around and how it's manicured. And I don't know of one time that I've ever looked for a house and said, let me see that foundation. That is one beautiful foundation. That foundation, is, we don't even see the foundation. So this tells me that Abraham, the father of our faith, had a priority that was designed by God, instilled in him by God, that if you want to look for something that's been made by God, the first thing you want to do is look at the, art, look, look at the, uh, the what did I just say it was? Foundation. <laughs> it's going to start this thing again. Last week, I don't know how to describe this to you, my tongue started getting really slow in my, and heavy in my mouth. I don't know uh, what that is, but uh, anyway, I just felt it again. So hopefully it's not contagious. But whose architect and builder is God, the foundations, looking for the foundation. So 
Abraham's looking, not knowing where he's going, and he's looking for a place, a building, that has foundations that have been set by God. What we are talking about in the atonement is a foundational message. The foundation of this message has been set into place by God. It would really, really do us good to look at the foundations of the gospel. And so this morning, I'm going to look yet again at another aspect of the gospel, the good news. We talked about last week, the message of the cross is the power of God released into the human experience. No cross, no message. No cross, no power is basically what he's saying. That when we preach this, there is a supernatural power that's released. Heaven bears witness with the message of the cross. Hell denies the existence of the message of the cross. And so, as hard as this is to preach this in its fullness, because the message is exhaustive, it's amazing. It's so frustrating to try to choose a topic that comes under the atonement because it is so big that it's laborious for me to try to sort out what needs to be said. And yet at the same time, knowing that there are several hundreds of verses that are going to talk about what I'm, what I'm going to talk about today that I've missed. And so trying to balance this as a pastor, trying to shepherd, trying to, trying to feed, it is so hard so difficult to go, do we say this? Do I say this? Knowing that when I say this, I don't even understand what I am saying, Harley, because, meaning, I have not had the full-on experience of what this verse is talking about. And yet, those, these verses are throughout Scripture. There's several verses that speak of an experience that I have not, I've never experienced before. Therefore, I don't know what it means, but yet I know and I'm believing that God wants to release this. Do you understand? And so in a way, I'm preaching beyond, I'm out over my skis this morning, so to speak. But because what I'm saying is true and it has relevance in the kingdom, I'm going to speak it. I'm going to talk about it. So in review, last week we talked about, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. At some point, we are going to talk about this thing, this term called righteousness. Right now, we don't really have a good definition for it. We're like, yeah, okay, just keep moving. Uh, just keep reading. Sometimes I just read stuff, and if I don't understand, I just keep reading until I do understand. Jesus wept. I got that one. And so we, we learned last week that the gospel is the good news. Remember I was talking about this trek of the good news and like, Lord, what? if I'm supposed to be walking in the good news, where's the evidence in my life that I'm walking under the good news? Because when I say good news or the gospel, it doesn't impact me. It's just kind of dead. It's something I learned in Sunday school, which I'm not against Sunday school whatsoever. I'm not against my heritage. I'm not against the, the church that I grew up in, the Nazarene church. I'm not, I'm not against any of that. They talked about it. It was good. It was truth. I've not entered in yet to the experience of that truth. And the gospel is meant to be experienced. The love of God is meant to be experienced. It's not just some fantasy that we agree to, like on a true or false test. God loves you, true or false, true. No, we're supposed to have this experience, this encounter with the living God. And so what we are talking about this morning is foundational truth. It has been laid out by the great architect of heaven. So we're going to be looking at this. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The message of the cross, you could say, is the power of God. The message of the cross is the power of God. Something is revealed. Something is opened. If, I found, I said this last week, if, I find myself saying this, if this is boring to me, I realize I don't have it. If God is so, went to such great lengths to announce the arrival of his son in such a way for the purpose 
of what his son was going to do on the cross, there's a good chance I don't, under, I don't have it. I don't have it. I don't understand fully what he's talking about. I've not experienced it yet. And so we're going to start this morning. And I'll say this. So the, the message of the cross, the gospel, is what has qualified us to be able to enjoy all the benefits that we like to enjoy, like his love, his favor, his peace, his power. It's the cross. This is, this is huge. Some of us are like, I've already got this. I'm ready to go on. It's like, ugh. I don't think we do. And so the thing about it is, is as we learn about the cross and the benefits, there's something that happens internally where our faith is actually clicked in dialed in, and we have what I would call a confident agreement in the truth of what he's talking about. The confident agreement is actually faith. So how, does, how do we get faith? Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God, that's right. So I'm trusting, that as, trusting the Lord that as I speak on this, he's going to do his part and begin to increase our faith as this word is preached. The thing that, and I said this last week, it just came out, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, that was an incredible statement. Unless we see the cross, unless we see the benefits of what he's done, we are left only looking at ourselves and our inabilities and our insecurities and our unworthiness and our, it goes ad infinitum. And eventually, what happens is, is that, as that sets in, what it does is, is it reinforces a, a wrong doctrine to where we think that our salvation and our success, so to speak, is about us. I hate to tell you this, it's not. And that, hearing that, is so illogical that we don't know where to put it. First Peter 1.18 says this, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold and silver. Weird language. Talking about a human being, this is kind of weird language in that the language is talking about paying and ransom. It's talking about a transaction, a, a, a transaction but with you and me are involved with God. Somehow we were locked up, we were slaves, and in order for us to have freedom, God had to pay something in order for us to be free. It's just kind of... And, and, and Peter goes on to say, and it's not just mere gold and silver. Don't even think in those terms. Gold and silver is not valuable enough to free you and to free me in God's economy. But he is talking about currency. There is a currency that he's referring to. If you keep on reading, the currency, it says, was the precious blood of Christ, who was the sinless spotless lamb of God. Remember that. That's a very important phrase. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began, but now he has, he has now revealed him to you in these last days. I just really messed up here. <laughs> my, my whole thing went, <laughs> was gone. I got it. I got it. Yeah. Thank you. And so I don't even know what this means. God chose him as your ransom long ago. I, I, I can't get my mental arms around that statement. I was like, what? God chose him as your ransom, as my ransom, before the world began. So one of the things I want us to look at is there are certain components when we, mention, when we talk about sacrifice, we talk about atonement. There are components to what makes up this, uh, uh, this word. So the components are in atonement is uh, there is an altar, so anytime that there was a, a sacrifice given, they had an altar, there was a sacrifice, the person doing it was in obedience, sometimes there was wood, 
but all the time there was blood. So again, I'm going to bring, be bringing up terms that are a little bit gross, but there's something in God's heart that was actually motivated by love for him to go to such an extreme that he went to. It's part of the cost. So this morning, I want to look at the significance of the blood. Blood had to be shed in order for atonement to happen. Blood had to be shed for us to come back into right standing with God. It was all around blood. In Hebrews 9.22, it says, In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Or in some uh, translations, it says there's no remission of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there's no release from us being in bondage to sin. There's no release. Without remission of sins, there's no life. So the shedding of blood and the life are in tandem with each other. By the shedding of his blood, I know you've heard this before, by the shedding of his blood, he obtained a new life for us. In Exodus 12, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. What is he referring to? The Passover. The Passover. By the institution of the Passover, the people were taught that life can only be obtained by the death of a substitute. So they learned this. Life was possible for them, but only through the blood of a life that was given in their place. In Exodus 24, Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you. So the Lord and Israel made a covenant, and blood was shed. And uh, actually, it was appropriated by having it sprinkled on the people. But the blood that the covenant had was the actual foundation and the power that Israel was to walk in in their relationship with God from that point on. I want to show you there's a benefit to what just happened because in the next verse, after the blood had been sprinkled, after the blood had been shed, the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God and they ate and drank. Man saw God for the first time and did not die. Why? Because blood has been shed on a covenant and so the justice side of God was appeased. Therefore, that opened up the intimacy side to man, and man actually interacted with God for the first time and did not die. It's by the blood alone that God and man can be brought into fellowship. There's no access to God by a sinful man without blood. For the life of the body, in Leviticus 17, uh, 1711, for the life of the body is in its blood. I have given you the blood on the altar to purify you, making you right with the Lord. It is the blood given in exchange for a life that makes purification possible. And so he's talking about the sacrifices that are made. And yet my question is, is what's the difference in Jesus' blood and this blood? Why does Jesus' blood actually have power and this doesn't? Well, the power of the blood is in the worth of the life. The power of the blood is in the worth of the life. So Jesus, the Son of God, the blood that was flowing through his veins had the power of divine life. 
For instance, when Jesus was walking uh, uh, and the, women, the woman with the issue of blood came up behind him and says, if I could just touch his, the cloak of his garments, I would be healed. She touched him, and there's all of these people, hundreds, maybe thousands of people walking around, and Jesus goes, whoa, who just touched me? They're like, what? Are you kidding? What do you mean who just touched you? Everybody's trying to touch you. He goes, no, no, no. I perceive that power left me. The power that was in his veins as he was walking, he perceived that someone touched him and the power left. That's what was flowing through his veins. It's the power of the divine life. However, so, so his blood that flows through his veins has infinite power. Infinite in the, in the space of time. It never stops. It's infinite. It's eternal. Infinite power in that nothing can trump it. It is the most powerful thing on the earth. It is the most powerful thing in heaven. It's the blood of Jesus. However, that power that I'm talking to you about could not be exercised for our reconciliation until the blood was shed. When Jesus' blood was shed, it actually released the life of God into the world. We were made right with God, but that's not all. <clears throat> One of the things that the blood accomplished for us was a deliverance. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and transferred us or conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin. Something else happened. So what I'm, I feel like this, is what I'm, this message is like this, this morning is, is I'm just opening windows of all the benefits or some of the benefits of the blood of Jesus. And so in a way, I feel like I'm just kind of, you know, going, well, there's that and there's that and there's that. Well, uh, you know, it, it opened up for this, it opened up for that. There's actually a, a deliverance that happened. It transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the, of the light of his glorious son, which we're just reading, and we don't under comprehend what that's actually talking about. Up until then, man lived under the domain or the power or the authority of darkness. That means that under the authority of darkness, can you remember when you were walking in darkness? I can remember when I walked in darkness. I was subjected all the time to terror, to fear, to disappointment, to shame, to disease, to death. All of these things were constantly oppressing me. Not only that, but I'd say the overarching theme of walking under the canopy of darkness is might as well call it the canopy of an orphan. An orphan has to fight for themselves, they have to feed themselves, they have to defend themselves. Why? Because there's no one else that will do it. That's the role of a father. Or that's the role of a parent. If you're an orphan, you don't, you're not, you don't have access to any of that. And so having access, living in confusion, living in frustration, living under a lie, living under disappointment, all of the, living under rejection. In Jesus, the Father said, because the, the blood of my son's been shed, I'll initiate this. I'm going to transfer you out of this environment over into the environment of the son of my love. Well, what does the son of his love look like? Well, for, well the first thing, it looks like adoption. We now have a dad. You now have a dad. No more of this orphan stuff. Now we have someone who will provide, who will feed, who will defend, who will protect. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, but now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to him. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus. Can I just tell you, if you're feeling far away from him right now, the power of the blood of Jesus has the same ability to draw you near to the Father. If you recognize the blood of Jesus and begin to say, Father, I stand before you now because of the blood of Jesus. There is something that connects directly to your spirit. And you know, without a doubt, you're standing there 
not on the merits of your own, but on the merit of the blood, of the truth of the blood of Jesus. It's amazing. It'll cut right through that orphan spirit just like that. It'll cut right through your insecurities, all your unworthiness. And you're right, you are unworthy. But because of the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus makes us all worthy. Romans, it says, for everyone is sent. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet with undeserved kindness... Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. So basically, Jesus conquered the power of sin, and he brought it to nothing. Is basically what this verse is saying. He released us from the penalty of sin. That's huge. The penalty of sin is magnanimous. We were all born into sin. And we're all suffering under the penalty of sin, especially the penalties that our forefathers walked in. Those penalties were now released on us. And so Jesus came in and says, I will wipe away even the penalties of sin. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice, and here's a big word, propitiation. It's a biblical term that basically just means this. It's the sacrifice that removes the wrath of God. So if I could just tell you, he's, he's not mad at you. Because of this sacrifice, Jesus was the propitiation for that wrath. So he's not mad at you anymore. That's actually good news. And everyone's getting a root canal after this, so I don't know. <laughs> So God presented Jesus as a sacrifice. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness for he himself is fair and just. Everyone say fair and just. Fair. He declares sinners to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. There it is, black and white, straight out of Scripture. So perfect is the reconciliation, and so complete has sin been covered and blotted out that he who believes in Jesus Christ is looked upon and treated by God as entirely righteous. All of your guilt's it's been removed. It's done. You believe in my son? <sighs> Therefore, there is absolutely nothing to prevent you or me from approaching God in complete freedom. Nothing, nothing is necessary except for faith in the blood. Oh, but God, but you don't know what I've done. I've done this, I've done that. No, 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 no. What you don't understand, that the blood of my son more than pays for anything that you could ever do. It's an overpayment, if you would. The blood of my son, nothing trumps it. Yeah, but I've, been, I've done this, I've done this. I've been, you don't understand, the blood of my son trumps that. There's nothing you can do that's going to outdo the sacrifice that my son gave for you. Have faith in this blood for you. Wherever you are, have faith in the blood for wherever you are at. No, 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 you're not supposed to end a sentence with a preposition. <laughs> are you English teachers out there? Oh, dear God, I can't believe. <laughs> for where you are, the blood of Jesus trumps everything. Whatever you're struggling with, the blood of Jesus. Whatever your fears are, the blood of Jesus. It's amazing. So, question is, is what makes the blood so powerful? In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is in the law. It's talking about the law of Moses. Under the law of Moses, man was required to walk sinless before God. Sinless in thought, in deed, action, just sinless. No one has ever done it. Everyone's fallen short. 
except for one. There's one person that was born that walked sinless before God. That's Jesus. Jesus, it says, came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. In his fulfillment, what that means is he accomplished it. He did it. He walked before the Lord, before God, his Father, sinless. So by perfectly fulfilling the law, when Jesus died and shed his blood under the curse of the law, his blood made sin entirely powerless. He trumped it. He walked under the law, but because he was sinless, his blood completely trumped the power of sin. Now, so the blood has its power not only because of the life of God's Son, but because it was given that blood as an atonement for sin. That's why Scripture speaks so highly of the blood of Jesus. Did you get that? He walked under sin's curse, yet he was innocent, sinless. When he shed his blood as an atoning sacrifice, the power that was in that blood rendered sin completely powerless. In Hebrews 9, 12, it says, with his own blood, here's another benefit, not only did he transfer us, not only did he conquer the power of sin, but with his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered to the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. With his own blood, he showed in the most holy place. Where's the most holy place? The most holy place is the place where God dwells. It's the dwelling place of the Most High. This does not necessarily refer to heaven. Jesus referred to this. Jesus talked about this. It refers to a holy, a spiritual holy place of God's presence, which is actually in you and I. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So he's talking to the woman at the well in John chapter 4. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So it's not a location necessarily, although it can be, but it's actually in the heart. Wherever, wherever he dwells, is he dwelling in your heart? Is he dwelling in your spirit? That's a holy place to the Lord. The power of the blood has entirely destroyed sin, death, grave, the hell, uh, the hell, the grave, hell, you name it. Where the holy place is, is where God's presence is. Where God's presence is, is where his joy is. It's where his favor is. It's where his blessing abounds. It's where his love flows, is in the holy place. And so... In Hebrews 10, 19, and so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of what? The blood of Jesus. You and I now have access to this place because of the blood of Jesus. No merit of your own. Just simply come in showing, proclaiming the blood of Jesus. You're in. This is a very powerful, powerful uh, verse. Try this at home. When you get before the Lord, get quiet before the Lord and walk in proclaiming the blood of Jesus and see where you get, you're gonna get right in front of the throne. It's amazing. Something about the blood of Jesus removes the performance issue. There is no performance. You don't have to perform. He's not looking for performance. He's looking for the blood of Jesus. Admission to the holy place belongs to God. He thought of it, he created it, he prepared it. And we have the right or the freedom to enter it because of the blood of Jesus. And we're getting a root canal after this. <laughs> I'm just kidding. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. There was a curtain that separated man and God. By his death, by his blood, when the blood was shed, that curtain was ripped in half 
signifying there's nothing now between us and God. God's saying, I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. The sacrifice is enough. The blood is enough. It's more than enough. And if that's not enough, we have a high priest, which is Jesus. Since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. The blood speaks for us. It pleads for us to God with an eternal effect. I said this in the first service. There's a scripture in Revelation 5, 9, where uh, Jesus comes on the scene, and everyone is saying, Worthy are you, O God, for you were slain, and you purchased men and women from every tribe, from every nation, from every tongue. You purchased them with your blood. Glo you deserve all the honor, all the glory, all the power, all the dominion. And this song is not a one-time song. It will go, it's an eternal song. We will still be singing this through the ages. Millions and billions of years from now, we'll still be singing this song because of the power and the magnitude of what he has done. Don't feel bad if you don't understand it right now. It, you, you've got millions and millions of years to understand it. This thing is going to keep unpacking, but I'm pointing to the magnificence of what it's happened now, the magnificence of what we're standing in, and we're all brain dead, which is actually okay. Like, it's like, you know, standing in front of Niagara Falls going, well, I sure am thirsty. <laughs> Sin took away our freedom to approach God the blood restores it. In 2 Corinthians, it says, For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. No longer counting people's sins against them. You confess it, the, my son's blood covers it. God has offered the perfect release from us, for us from all of our sin and the guilt. Most of the stuff, it's the guilt. The guilt from stuff I've done in the past still haunts me today. I have a tendency to check myself out of being worthy because of the stuff I did way back 20, 30 years ago. It still hangs over me. And he's like, oh, no, no, the power of the blood, the blood can actually sprinkle your guilty consciences. Even your conscience, maybe you don't have anything right now that's pending before God, but all of your past, all the things that, that the enemy's using to bring up guilt about, it covers that as well. Because reconciliation has been made for sin, which is the blood, we can now be reconciled to God no matter what we've done. So the thing about it is, is Scripture, the Old Testament is full of illustrations of this. This, is just, this just didn't pop up in the New Testament. Look at this. In Isaiah 44, 22, God says, I have swept away your sins like a cloud. I have scattered your offenses like the morning mist. Oh, return to me, for I have paid the price to set you free. Whew. Also in Isaiah, for you have cast all of my sins behind your back. Oh, these are... Okay. Okay, all right, I forgive you. Now, what do you want to talk about? In Micah chapter 7, verse 19, you will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. What an amazing feat. What an amazing heart. What an amazing God. This is illogical. It makes no sense. He hurls them into the depths of the sea. If you've heard Corey Tin Boom, she says, and he puts up a sign that says, no fishing. <laughs> the last one is Jeremiah 50, 20. In those days and in that time, says the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought, but there shall be none. And the sins of Judah, but they shall not be found, for I will pardon those whom I preserve. If you're a believer this morning, 
this pardon is for you. He doesn't recognize us according to our failures. He recognizes us according to the fact that we appropriate the blood of Jesus and we realize it's not, it's not according to anything that I've done or haven't done. It's all because of the blood of Jesus. And the invitation this morning is to put everything under the blood of Jesus. Let's stand. I'm going to go ahead and ask for the ministry team if you guys could come on up. And take your place. I believe that, that it would be inappropriate for us to speak about the blood of Jesus and not have application for the blood of Jesus to be applied. Now, I don't even know what that means directly to you, but you know what it means. And I would invite you to come up and take advantage, if you would, of this appropriation of the blood of Jesus. There's nothing you've done. There's nothing you can do. It trumps everything. The blood of Jesus is all-powerful. All-powerful. Nothing can trump it. Because of the blood of Jesus, we have access to healing. We have access to his throne. We have access. We have forgiveness from sins. And so I want to invite you, if you would, if you would come make your way to this aisle right here to my right, to your left, we've got a team of people up here that would love to pray with you. Not to embarrass you, but to see sin's power broken off of you. So Lord, I just ask, Lord, this morning that, th that you would release yet another dimension of the transference of us being transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the, of the son of your love. Lord, I ask, Lord, that there would be a fresh release of the adoption of God. The spirit of adoption, would you come into the room? I just feel like that there's people that you know all of this and you've heard this before, and, and, and yet you're still operating under the influence of an orphan. The Lord wants to break that off of you. If you stay in that cycle of an orphan, you'll, it's a cycle. It's a, it's a rut. You can't get out because you're constantly coming into disagreement with what his son's sacrifice has done for you. Jesus' sacrifice was meant, it was spent in order to bring about an adoption that you and I could never, ever, ever work ourselves into. It's, it's free, it's totally free. And so Lord, I ask Lord for those, uh, uh, for everyone here, Lord, that you would release onto us, Lord, just like what Becky prayed, a fresh baptism of your love. Somehow, Lord, break through all of the folly and all of the confusion and all of the misinterpretation and all and all and all and all, all of the false teaching, Lord. Would you bring about, Lord, the truth? I ask, Lord, for the power, the spirit of truth to come. And I ask, Lord, Lord, I ask you, would you do us a favor? Would you shoo the birds, the spiritual birds of the air that want to steal this seed? Would you remove them in the name of Jesus? I pray, Lord, that the seeds, what you are doing right now, what you are building into us, what you are laying a foundation, pointing to a foundation. Lord, I ask, Lord, that you would protect, uh, Lord, what's been spoken here. Go before us. Be behind us. I just bless you. I bless you with favor in the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, one of the things I just remembered was when Jesus went through the Sermon on the Mount at the very end, remember what he talked about? Whoever hears these teachings of mine and acts on them will be like a man who built his house on a rock. The rock is the foundation. And when the storms of life hit, which they will, his house was unmovable. Because of what? Because of the foundation. So I pray that the truths of the foundations of what I'm talking about will actually be firm for you and your house. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. You're dismissed.